Exodus 34, 6. Um, we're going to be there later on in the sermon, but it just my mind pointed, uh, my mind went back to that text when we were singing, uh, in glad adoration, we, uh, we come to behold him. We want to behold him in glad adoration. What are we beholding? We're not given a vision of God. We can't see him with our eyes. What are we beholding? The same thing Moses beheld in Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We come to behold him. We come to behold him. In glad adoration because he is a God who is merciful and gracious and slow to anger. Um, that, that is a reason for worship. Uh, we are in a sermon series. Oh, we got a little ring going on here. Uh, we're in a sermon series on the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. And, and what we're discovering is that for the, uh, the people of God, those who, who have been changed by the Spirit of God, uh, there are certain outcomes in their life. If, if you have trusted in Jesus, you've been changed by the power of the gospel, it's going to bring certain outcomes in your life. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul lists some of them. He says that the fruit of the Spirit, the outcome of the Spirit's work in your life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the kinds of people that God is creating us to be. This is who we want to be. And this morning, uh, we're just kind of going one by one. And this morning, we're going to be looking at patience together. Or we're going to look at patience. Uh, maybe you've heard the old joke where people say, whatever you do, don't pray for patience because then God's going to put you in situations where you're going to need patience. Uh, maybe you've heard that joke before a couple of weeks ago. I was at my son's football game. We went out to, uh, to Temple uh, for a football game. Uh, the game was at 7 o'clock, and, you know, it had been a long day, and the game was at 7, and, and it was kind of a, a long game, a little frustrating game. They won, but it was a frustrating game. It rained for like half of it. And then it's time to go home. The game's over. It's time to go home. My son just played a football game. He wants to get a burger. So we stop at a little burger spot, well-known burger spot right there in Temple, uh, and I've got, the whole family's with me. It's a school night. I want to go home. They need to get home. He's got homework. He needs to go home. And so we're kind of doing this. And I go in, and y'all stay in the car. I'll go order inside. You know, the drive throughs crazy. So I hit the kiosk, and I, I order the burger. All I ordered was burger and shake. That's all I ordered. They immediately hand me the shake, and then I waited for 30 minutes for a burger. You guys, thank you. In the first service, they were like, well, what's 30 minutes? You guys <laughs> validated my feelings. I waited. I mean, it was comically slow. I thought I was being pranked. Like, I'm looking for the hidden cameras, thinking I'm being pranked. All I ordered was a burger. There's a couple of times that I peeked back there, like, there are the patties, there are the buns. If I could get back there and just make my burger real fast and get out of here, they wouldn't even know I was there. Well... Uh, the deal is, what ran through my mind was, you're about to preach patience in two weeks. <laughs> your, <laughs> your opening illustration cannot be, a couple weeks ago, I got thrown out of a Whataburger. <laughs> uh, so on the outside, I was cool. On the inside, I was frustrated. So don't, don't, you know, don't pray for patience because God's going to put you in situations where you're going to have to use patience. Look, I get that, and I get that that's just a joke. But as I, as I think about that, as we're diving into this idea of patience, um, I want to be a changed person. I, I want to be somebody that exhibits the fruit of the Spirit. I want to be somebody who could be described... Uh, with characteristics of love and joy and peace and patience. Like, I want that for my life. Um, and what we know about God is that gold is refined in fire, not pixie dust and well wishes. Gold is refined by fire. Sometimes that fire's a Whataburger. Uh, 
Well, we're going to talk about patience today and kind of the trajectory of where we're going is we're going to define patience uh, according to the Bible. And then, and then we're, going to, uh, we're going to think about this idea that God is patient, so we should be patient with people, and we should be patient with our circumstances. Okay? So let's define patience first. What do we mean by patient when we tell our children to be patient? What are we asking them to do? We're asking them to be really good at waiting. Be really good at waiting. Like at Christmas, we buy them a present and we put it under the tree. And they, if when they're real small, they don't know the game and they want to open that present right away. And we tell them, no, you have to be patient. What are we asking them not to do? Don't throw a temper tantrum. Don't, don't become angry, frustrated. Don't sneak down in the middle of the night and open the present when no one's looking. We're asking them to be really good at waiting, and that's kind of how the Bible talks about patience. There's really two aspects to this patient waiting in the Bible. Um, there's, there's the idea of waiting on circumstances to change, and then there's the idea of waiting on people to change. So circumstances to change, like in James chapter 5, James tells us that Job, the character for from the Old Testament is an example of someone who is patient because when all of these terrible things happened in his life, he didn't reject God, but he was steadfast in his trust in the Lord. So he's a, a patient man. He was patient in his circumstances. There's also a sense in which patience is waiting for a person to change, not circumstances, but a person to change. Uh, you might use the word tolerance or forbearance for this kind of patience. And we're, we're told, we'll look at a second, but we're told in the New Testament that we should be a people who are patient with one another. God himself is patient uh, with people. We're told that the whole reason that God hasn't returned to judge the wicked yet, it's not because he's slow and taking his time, but it's because he's patient, that he doesn't want anyone to perish, but that all would come to repentance. So he's waiting on people to change. Patience is waiting. Sometimes we can understand a word by understanding its opposite. So what is the opposite of patience? Proverbs chapter 14 helps us with that. Proverbs 14, 29 says that whoever is patient has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. So for Proverbs 14, 29, what's the opposite of patience? Well, the opposite is anger or a short temper. The opposite of patience is a short temper, it's anxiety, it's frustration, it's negativity. So for us this morning, patience is waiting. It's, it's waiting. Waiting on a person, waiting on a situation, waiting for change. And, and really, Christian patience would, would understand that we're waiting on, on God's best outcome. That's what we want the change to be, to God's best outcome. And the timing is God's best timeline. Right? We're waiting on God's time and God's best. So, so this is patience. And, and we need to point out that patience is the fruit of the Spirit. Patience is the outcome of God's work in your life. Like if the Spirit of God is alive in you, then you are someone who can be characterized, described as patient. So we've defined patience. Now we're going to move. We're going to say that God is patient. God is patient. And I had you in Exodus 34, 6. You probably all closed it when I was done, but that's where we're going to be again. So you can find that again, Exodus 34. God is patient. And one of the ways that the Old Testament, the, the primary way that the Old Testament talks about the patience of God is this phrase, slow to anger. Slow to anger. And we saw that in Exodus 34, 6, that God is slow to anger. And, and in that verse, 34, 6, God is telling Moses what he is like. What happened right before this scene? What happened? God delivered the people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. They were slaves. He delivered them with the 10 plagues and through the parting of the Red Sea. And they, they reach the other side and they escape the Egyptian army. And what happens immediately after that, almost immediately, they begin to complain. 
God, we're gonna die in the desert. We don't have enough to eat. There's nothing to drink. We're gonna die. So what does God do? He provides food for them in the wilderness. He provides water in the desert for them. Well, then they reach Mount Sinai, and what happens there? They immediately turn their back on God. As soon as things don't look the way that they thought maybe it should, they turn their back on God, and they fashion for themselves an idol, a golden calf, and they worship this idol, and they say, this is the God, this is the God who rescued us from Egypt. Well, no, that's ridiculous. You just made that God. The, the, the other God is on Mount Sinai. The people of God immediately forget his goodness and his provision, and they turn their backs on him, and it happens over and over and over again. So on the heels of this forgetfulness, on the heels of this ungratefulness, this idolatry, this wickedness, on the heels of all of that, look at how God describes himself. He says in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God could have described himself in a lot of ways. God is holy, God is just, God is mighty, God is omnipresent. He could have described himself in these ways, but he, de he decided to describe himself to Moses in the midst of all of the people's rebellion. He described himself as merciful, gracious, slow to anger. This phrase, slow to anger in Hebrew, makes me laugh a little bit because uh, literally it's long nostrils. Uh, and so you're laughing it's a Hebrew idiom, and it actually corresponds to something we say in English all the time. When somebody has a temper, we call them a hothead, right? We call them a hothead, or, or uh, back when Looney Tunes was a thing, what happened when a character got really mad? Steam came out of their ears. Well, in Hebrew, the same thing's happening. The idea is that somebody who is uh, angry, they have a, a, a hot nose, so, so for you, we would say when somebody gets really mad, their face might turn red. Well, in the Hebrew language, the way that they describe anger is they said you have a hot nose. And so somebody who has long nostrils, it's like saying they have a long fuse. It takes a long time for those nostrils to ignite, for that nose to get hot. Here's what's being said when we say that God is slow to anger. What's being said is that God is not a hothead. God doesn't have a quick temper. And that's really good news for you and me, isn't it? How many times have you failed him? How many times have you said never again and then it happened again? How many times have you enjoyed the provision and the protection of God only, only right after that you seem to forget that he has protected you and provided for you? How many times have you prayed so hard for something and then God answered and then just a few days later, you forget and you're ungrateful again. How many times have you repeated the same sins, but how many times has he offered you a way back? And how many times has he extended mercy? How many times has he refrained from pouring out his just wrath on you? How many times has he refrained? See, God is patient with you. God is not quick to lose his temper. God is not a hothead. It, it reminds me of, of, of a father teaching his child how to walk. How, how does that go when a father teaches his child how to walk? Maybe the mother stands the child up and kind of holds him by the hips. And the father stands just a few steps away and says, says, come to daddy. And what happens? The mom lets go. The child takes a couple of wobbly steps maybe and then they're down on all fours crawling again. How does the father respond to that interaction? Hey, we're walking here, we're not crawling anymore. Is that how the father responds? No. The father celebrates the steps, even the wobbly ones, even though there were only two. He celebrates the steps. Our father is not a hothead, he is patient with you. He is slow to become angry with you. No matter how wayward you have been, he is slow to anger. God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh. God is patient. 
And by the way, God is not only patient with the people who are on his side. God is also patient with his enemies. In 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, Peter tells us that God was patient in the days of Noah. God was patient in the days of Noah. You think about the story of Noah and the ark. The reason that there was a flood is because the people of the land were exceedingly wicked. We're told in Genesis 6 that every intention of man's heart was only evil all the time. That's what we're told. And yet God was patient in the days of Noah before he sent judgment. God was patient both with his people and with his enemies. So as a, as a people who, who trust in Jesus, a people who love God, we want to be like God. So with the, these characteristics of God, we, we want to imitate them. We, we want to imitate these characters of God. And so God is patient. And so here's the second piece that we're doing. We should be patient with others. We, we should be patient with people. You know, we're commanded to be patient. Uh, you can turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 3. We're commanded to be patient. Kind of the flow of uh, Paul's thinking in Colossians, it's pretty similar to Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, but the way he's, he's working at it is, is if your mind is set in heaven, you, you should set your mind on the things that actually matter, set your mind in heaven, and if your mind is set in heaven, that's gonna have particular outcomes in your life. That, that's the same as the fruit of the Spirit. If the Spirit's working in your life, there will be fruit that's produced. If your mind is set in heaven, there's gonna be certain outcomes in your life. There's gonna be some things that you should put off, and there's some things that you should put on, like changing your clothes. And, and some things that you should put off are things like sexual immorality and covetousness. But look what he says in Colossians 3, verse 12 through 14. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We are commanded to put on Patience, it's a command. Where does that come from? Where, do, where does our patience come from? I believe that our patience comes from an attitude of humility and trust. Humility and trust. Pride hinders patience. See, when we're impatient with other people, it's because we feel like we're smarter, we're better, we're more capable, they're too slow, they're too wrong, they should have known better. If only they knew as much as I did, they would not have acted in that way. So we're impatient with others out of pride. And that, those things might actually be true, though. Like, you might actually be smarter, and you might actually be better or more capable. They might actually be too slow, but here's the deal with all of that. God is patient with us, and he's smarter, and he's more capable, and we're wrong. We should have known better, but God is slow to anger. He's not a hothead, and, and he has every reason to look down his nose at us and be frustrated with us, and yet he's patient. Every day, he patiently bears with us. But for some reason, for some reason every day, we're tempted to be impatient with others. Pride hinders patience. Unbelief hinders patience because I, I, I'm unwilling to be patient because I don't believe that God is working on them like he's working on me. You know? Like, it's so I'm patient with myself. Well, I'll get it right one of these days. I didn't mean harm but we're impatient with others because we're unwilling to believe that God's also working on them and they're also in process and they're also on part of the journey, maybe not in the same place as me, but they're also on the journey. And we don't believe that God's got it. God's got that person. And God, their, their business with them, God is gonna take care of it. He will judge them, he will forgive them. That's between the two of them. I'm not involved. So there's unbelief in our hearts that hinders patience. So we should be patient with others. One more thing while we're on this subject. 
This is for like some people in the room. This isn't for all of you. Uh, be patient with yourself. Some of you are way too patient with yourself. <laughs> like get it together. <laughs> uh, but others of you, be patient with yourself. It's okay. You don't have to have it all put together. It's okay to make a mistake. Nobody expects you to be perfect. I'll, I'll challenge you with this thought. Can you be as patient with yourself as God is with you? Be patient with people, including yourself. So God is patient with us. We should be patient with others, but there's one more area where we need to exhibit patience, and that's in our circumstances. We should be patient in our circumstances. Sometimes we look at our lives and, and we think, my life should be different. The circumstances that I'm walking through right now, they should be different. I know the promises of God, and I know that he's for me and not against me, and I know that he says he's gonna meet every single one of my needs, but I look at my life, and that sure doesn't look like it's taking place. Like, I've been waiting on the Lord to resolve this broken relationship. I've been waiting on the Lord to heal my body. I've been waiting on the Lord to bring justice to a situation. I've been waiting on the Lord to answer me. I've been waiting on the Lord to bring clarity. I've been waiting on the Lord to lead me. And right now, I'm just waiting. Well, that's patience. That's patience. It's almost like you could say patience with God. I'm careful to say that because I don't want to give the impression that God is ever in the wrong. Like God needs my forgiveness. That's, that's not true. Um, you know, Tolkien wrote about the great wizard Gandalf. He said, Gandalf is never late, nor is he early. He always arrives precisely when he means to. That's God. He never arrives too late. He's never too early. But he's got a plan, and he's going to execute it. God never needs our forgiveness or our patience like he's done something wrong. But here's what you need to know. If you're going to walk with Jesus, there's going to be some waiting. Where does patience in our circumstances come from? I, I think that it comes from humility and trust. If I'm gonna be patient in my circumstances, I think I've got to have humility and trust because pride not only influences our impatience with others, pride also influences our impatience with our circumstances. When bad things happen to us, when things don't go the way that we wish that they were going or we're not getting the answer when we need the answer to come, we become impatient we're impatient because we think we deserve better. I'm a good person. I shouldn't be treated this way. Lord, I'm seeking after your will like you want me to. Why won't you answer me? I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. That's pride. Pride says, why me? Humility says, why not me? Pride says, why is God doing this to me? Humility says, thank you, Father, for working this for my good. That's pride. Pride causes us to be impatient in our circumstances, and unbelief also causes impatience in our circumstances. We've got to believe that God is going to work all things for our good. We've got to believe it. We've got to cling to that truth. In, in the book of James, James talks about Job. If you know the story of Job, Job experienced some of the worst things that you could experience in life. The loss of children, failing health the loss of property, he experienced these things. And the rest of the book of Job, most of it is basically Job kind of asking why. Why did these things happen? What's interesting is that God never answers him. You get to the end of book of the, the book of Job and God doesn't answer the question. Job's never told why. We get a little peek at the beginning of the book of why, some things going, in, going on in heaven. But Job never gets that peak. He doesn't know why, but he accepted his life as, as from the hand of God. His circumstances were painful, and he didn't like them, but he accepted them, and he trusted in God. He believed God. See, you and I, we may experience the difficulties of life, and we might never know why. 
God is not obligated to tell us why. But as it's been said, even if you can't see his hand, you can trust his heart. And you can know that his promises are certain, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in the end. And that he's working all things for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things, not some things. He has promised that he will. He has promised that he will. So I can endure in belief. I can, I can endure. I can persevere. And I can wait on the Lord to bring about what he's promised. It's kind of like Psalm 130. Here's what Psalm 130 says. In in verses one and two, it says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the the voice of my pleas for mercy. What he's saying there in verses one and two is my life feels like I'm drowning. I'm in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the night, and I can't see, and there's nobody else around me, and the waves are going up and down, and I'm calling out for help. I don't know if you've ever felt that way or, or maybe the circumstances that you're walking in right now, you feel that way now. What do you do when you feel like you're drowning? Psalm 130 verse five says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word, I hope. Here's what you do when you're drowning, you wait. You wait. And, and what does that look like? It, You hope in his word. You know what his word says, and so you cling to it with all of your might. And and what does that look like for you? Verse six, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning, he repeats himself. I almost to remind himself that he's got to wait like a watchman waits for the morning. How does a watchman wait for the morning? Expectantly. He's he's waiting for the morning to come. And he expects it to come. Why? Because it came yesterday. That sun rose yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. And I don't have a watch because this is this is old old time when they're riding this and there were no watches. So I don't know what time the sun is gonna rise, but I know it will. I don't know when God's gonna come through. But I know he will. I don't know when God's gonna be faithful to me, but he, but he was in the past and he will in my present and he will in the future be faithful to me more than watchmen for the morning. I am expectant, I am hopeful, waiting for that sun to rise. That's how you wait for the Lord. See, God is patient with us and we've got to be patient with people, other people and even ourselves, but we also have to be patient when our lives seem out of control. Here's what you can know. Even though your life might feel out of control, it's not. Everything is in his hands. I want to finish this morning with one question. And the question is, yes, but how? I don't know if you've thought that before as you're reading something in the Bible and there's a command to do something. You're like, yeah, yeah, okay. I can see how that's good. But how in the world am I going to do that? Yeah, that's good, but how? How? See, on the one hand, it's the Spirit's responsibility to make patience possible in your life. Patience is the fruit of the Spirit. I'm the vine. You are the branches, Jesus says. If, if Jesus is the vine and I'm only the branch and nutrients come from the vine, it's the vine's responsibility to produce what he wants on the branch. So it's God's job to produce patience in me. It's fruit of the Spirit. But then if it's only God's job, then why are we commanded be patient? It's because while the Spirit makes me alive and the Spirit empowers me and gives me what I need to do it, it's still my responsibility to do it. I still have to keep the command We are not passive in our sanctification. The sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like Jesus. The Spirit provides the power, but you and I have a role to play. We've got to obey the command. You know, God could snap his fingers, and he he could say, okay, 
When you trust in Jesus, you're all gonna look exactly as the New Testament says, and you don't have to do any work. You don't have to lift a finger, but that's not how God's chosen to do it. Walking with Jesus is a long, hard road. And what happens is God uses means in our life. He gives us the things we need to keep the commands that he's telling us to keep. What are the means that God uses to accomplish his purpose of patience in us? Well, one is the Bible. The psalmist says in Psalm 130, what helped him was that he hoped in God's word. How are you gonna hope in something that you never read and you don't understand and you don't know what's in it? You, you've gotta read God's word, even if it's just a little bit. You gotta read God's word. You gotta study it. You gotta memorize it. You gotta think about it. You gotta pay attention when it's being preached. You gotta take some notes. One of the ways that God is gonna develop patience in us is through his word. The Holy Spirit uses the power of the scriptures to change us. And, and another means that God uses to bring about patience in our life is prayer. You pray about the things that you're reading. You read and you learn things about who you are, about humility and, and what it means to be patient. You read these things and then you pray and you say, God, make these things so in my life. And then you pray for other people. You go, the people that you're impatient with, you go home and pray for them and see if that changes. It's kind of hard to be impatient with people when you're praying for them. You know, another means that God uses is community. Christian community, other people. When God saved you from your sin, he, he saved you from something, but he also saved you to something. He saved you from your sin and from judgment, but he also saved you to the people of God. And the people of God expressed here in a local congregation, you're sitting here and I hope that you would say Central is your local congregation. You were saved to be a part of this group that you would know other people. You wouldn't just come to worship, nobody knows your name, you stand up, walk out. That's not, that's not the point. The point is to be known by people. And your relationships with other believers, you are shaped and you, you see somebody else who sets an example for you and you follow. You know somebody well and they can speak hard truth into your life and they can talk to you about how you are impatient and those, those rough edges are being rubbed off as you are, are knowing other people and they are knowing you. That's one of the means that God uses to shape us. And you know, there's one other thing that God uses to shape us. One other way that he's gonna develop patience in your life. Man, it's your circumstances. God refines a person with fire fire doesn't feel good so when you're walking through difficulty and you're struggling maybe to make ends meet or you're struggling with your health even something as small as struggling to be patient at a burger joint God is using those circumstances to shape you and to mold you into the person that he wants you to be God refines a person with fire, difficulty, struggle. And after the fire, what comes out? Golden, gleaming, sparkling patience. In the midst of your hard times, humility and trust says, Father, thank you for developing patience in me. God is patient with us. We've got to be patient with people and we've got to be patient in our circumstances. This isn't a matter of behavior modification and just trying really hard. This is a matter of heart transformation, a renovation of the heart. And so may God renovate our hearts as we position ourselves for the Spirit's work in our lives.